so this is a class where we have a record number of people sign up. Um, we don't know how many are going to actually show up, but we did have 101 signups for the class. So that's yeah, really that's exciting. Insane a lot of people, us. a lot of people interested in this. It's, I think we're ready. Everyone ready? Want to jump right in? Yeah. Just over here. All right. So, just wow! Thank you, everyone, for signing up and coming to this class. This is this is amazing. Um, it's amazing that we have so much, so many people interested in this topic um, uh, in uh, technologies moving forward. Uh, so we are SPORE. Uh, we are supporting outreach, uh, public outreach, resources, and education. And I'm Jeanette Blasius. I'm the outreach director. Uh, we're a branch, uh, a program that is part of Mycelium, which is a 501c3 nonprofit organization. And in this umbrella, we have several different projects that we have developed and or, are, or at least writing up. Uh, one project that we have actually created was uh, we have a recycling corner that we create, we, that we put together uh, for the University of Alabama in Huntsville. Um, where we're located. We're, we are located in Huntsville, Alabama. And um, so this at this recycling corner, you can bring um, uh, plastics or recycled 3D prints and you can take them to this corner and it'll, it has a grinding machine. It grinds it up and turns it into new 3D printing materials. Uh, we also have uh, a 3D printing kiosk that we have the designs for that we're hoping eventually we'll be able to bring to fruition here. Um, and then we also have a project that we're uh, just started working on uh, and we just got funding for. It is a network robotics food system that we're gonna be building on site at another nonprofit called CASA that uh, they grow they have little gardens for uh, the elderly, elder, elderly community in Huntsville, Alabama, uh, who are unable to get food delivered to their homes and stuff. So what this farm bot uh, that we're going to be putting on site here is going to automatically grow the food. And so we'll be working with them on that. And then we have many other projects, including spore, uh, spore outreach uh, classes such as this one. Um, and so we're excited to bring this class to you. And I'll, with that, I'll take, hand it off to Ankur and uh, Andrea. All right. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, this is an introductory basic class on hydroponics and aeroponics. And uh, what, before we introduce ourselves, we also have our executive director, Dan Meisner, on the call. He's going to be monitoring the chat and um, he, he'll answer questions in the chat. So at any point, if you have any questions, please do ask on the chat. And at the end, we'll have 10 to 15 minutes for live Q&A. So my name is Ankur Shah. I'm the Director of Operations at Mycelium NGO, and uh, I have a background in environmental science. I'm really passionate about sustainability. And uh, my name is Andrea Nicolau. I have a background in environmental engineering and earth science. I'm currently a research associate for the University of Alabama in Huntsville, and a big supporter of Mycelium. Uh, before we start, we do want to say that we are not experts in hydroponics and aeroponics. We have a lot to learn, but, you know, we did this ourselves. We, you know, got our hands there. We want to share what we learned with you guys. So we're very excited to have you join us, and uh, let's get right into it. So uh, what are some of the reasons to do hydroponics? This is the why behind it. Firstly, uh, there is food insecurity. So nearly 10% of our global population, which is almost 800 million people, experience food scarcity. And um, this has worsened during the pandemic. Even in the United States and many other countries, there are instances during the lockdowns where farmers threw away perfectly good crops, fruits, vegetables, um, into the ground or in the trash. And the reason being, they couldn't sell food to uh, grocery stores and restaurants uh, during the lockdowns. At the same time, many people, homeless people, uh, lower income families were unable to meet their needs with food. And um, that's, that's a reason to learn how to do it. And that brings me to the second point. Uh, it is educational and empowering. So growing your own food is empowering, but you can also teach the skill to anyone, leading to more hyperlocal food and in most cases, healthier, directly produced by yourself food. And lastly, it is sustainable and resilient. Um, you know, our current food system relies on a lot of centralization and monoculture farms. 
But with hydroponics, you can have a sort of decentralization of production. So you can grow food indoors um, and independent of any climatic conditions. So no matter if it's winter or extremely hot, you can grow the food and without pesticides and using soil. So you don't use land um, as much with this method. So what is hydroponics? A basic definition is it's a method of farming without soil by using mineral nutrient solutions in an aqueous solvent. So that just means nutrients dissolved in water. And uh, the two major categories of hydroponics are active and passive. So we can, active means it has uh, a pump which uses electricity. So water is moved actively. Whereas in a passive system, as you can imagine, there's no electricity use. Um, it, it is either capillary or gravity, uh, capillary action or gravity, which moves water in a passive way. And um, the roots can be in direct or indirect or intermittent contact with nutrient solutions. And there are many systems which we'll describe in a moment. And aeroponics. Aeroponics is a subset, a branch of hydroponics where the process of growing plants happens in air or mist environment. Again, all of this without the use of soil. So aeroponics is by default an active system. Um, in this picture, it displays an aeroponic system. So the roots are suspended in the air and um, water is sprayed through a sprayer onto the roots periodically. In some cases, it's also misted. So, so the roots are suspended and water is just sprayed periodically. So they're not always in direct contact with the nutrient solution. So there are many types of hydroponic systems. These are six of the major ones. Uh, the first one is a deep water system. And this is a, a system that is an active one because it does use a pump. There's a plant and a bucket. Um, the, the roots are in the nutrient solution, but there is a pump, air pump that allows oxygen flow and actively induces air into the nutrient solution. So that's a deep water system. Then we have a wick system, which is a passive system. This has no electricity use. And uh, the unique thing is the roots are not in direct contact with the nutrient solution, but there is a wick, which is a absorbent capillary material. So this goes into the nutrient solution and it absorbs and transfers water upward into the me uh, growing medium. And that's how the roots get their nutrients. Then we have an ebb and flow system. And um, an ebb and flow system is an active system where you have a reservoir with a nutrient solution, a water pump, and the pump uh, transfers the water and floods the above layer, which has the plants and the roots, and then it drains it. So you can imagine the water keeps circling, but at no given time is the water just uh, static into, in the, in, on the roots. So water is recirculated and it's, it's an ebb and flow flood and drain system. And then you have a big branch of hydroponics called aquaponics. Um, this is a really cool system of growing where the fish provides the nutrients for the plants. So instead of using store-bought nutrients uh, or other external nutrients, the fish itself excretes and, and creates fertilizer for the plants growing. So it's a symbiotic relationship between the fish and plants. And then you have a cracky system. This is the easiest method and it's a passive method. It's, sim it's very similar to the wick system. The only difference being that instead of a wick connecting the roots to the nutrient solution, in a cracky system, the roots are directly immersed in the nutrient solution. So the, the, instead of the wick, there are roots touching the system. And uh, we'll go into much more detail into the system because we're gonna describe how to build your own cracky system. And um, this is a drip system where unlike the other uh, systems, the water nutrient solution is stripped from above. So instead of having the nutrient solution below the roots in most cases, uh, the nutrients are dripped from above and they seep into the growing medium and then touch the roots. So that's how they get their nutrients. And um, we have an aeroponic system that Andrea is gonna describe in extensive detail because we've made one and uh, we'll go over that soon. So there are physical and chemical aspects about hydroponic system. Uh, physical includes you need a growth medium, a substrate for your plants. You also need your net pots or bucket or a container where you're gonna have the nutrient solution. You need LED grow light if you're growing indoors. If you're growing outdoors, sun is fine. In chemical aspects, you, you need the nutrient solution as Uncle mentioned. And also in case of the deep water system, you do need a dissolved oxygen, a pump to 
pump air into your system. I'm just going to describe all of this later on. All right, so some two conditions to keep in mind. For most hydroponic systems, an ideal pH level is between 5.5 and 6.5. And it's always good to have a pH meter to monitor this because many plants uh, thrive in this pH range, but above or below can be dangerous for them. And then you have uh, relative humidity for the healthy growth of plants. So this is between 45 and 50%. And um, if you go above or below, it can lead to fungal diseases, which we'll describe. But it's, it's again, a good practice to have a pH meter and a hygrometer to measure pH and humidity in the system. So like any other system, there are advantages and disadvantages about hydroponic system. Uh, compared to conventional farming, some of the advantages are you can grow anywhere. So we have our hydroponic system in my apartment, so we grow indoors. You can also grow year round if indoors because you have the climatic control of the environment. Uh, you don't use any pesticides, again, because the environment is sterile, you control everything, you don't need uh, to use uh, pesticides. There's no soil, so no tilling, no mulching, no land is used, so it's less messy as well. Uh, you end up using less water because you have a water cycle, you can uh, reuse that nutrient solution, that water, so water is saved. Harvesting ends up being easier because you have everything localized and, you know, it's not on the soil, it's out of the ground, you don't need to bank anything, anything like that, so harvesting is easier. And it also ends up being very low maintenance, especially if you have uh, an automated uh, system. And again, you have the control of the nutrients, so no fertilizer uh, is needed, and the application of the nutrients is very precise because you're going to provide to the plants exactly what they need. And that leads to the last point in advantage is that the plant nutrient content can be 50% higher because you're providing again exactly what it needs and there's no change in the environment. There's no rain, there is no other uh, chemical, um, you know, messing with your system. And some of the disadvantages, uh, it is more expensive, especially the initial investment. We are gonna talk about costs of parts later on. Um, in an active system, you, you know, you're, you can have a, vulnerability to power outages, especially if you have an automated system. Uh, disease, um, you know, if one plant uh, gets disease, it will spread uh, fastly to the other plants, so you have to take care of that. It can lead to smell because, you know, microorganisms can creep in rather easily, so you have to be aware of that as well. Uh, depending on space, you know, the production can be, lim be limited depending on the system size you have. And also, if you're going to have a huge uh, system with many LED lights and all of that, the electricity bill can also uh, go up a little bit. And we're going to talk about that. Uh, and then you need, you know, special technical knowledge and right tools uh, to do this. Not as easy as having a garden outdoors. Yeah. So with that, um, as promised, this class is going to show you how to build your own system. So let's get right into assembly. So the first method that we want to briefly discuss is a simple bucket or a track key system. So as we described, this system is a passive system, doesn't need any electricity, but um, the roots here in the plant are immersed in the water. So imagine this as day one on this um, left side. And after 30 days, the roots absorb the water, the roots absorb the nutrient solution and the plant grows and creates an oxygen layer uh, down. So at any given point, only a fraction of the roots are actually submerged in the nutrient solution and it grows automatically without you doing anything. You just need to make sure um, its health is fine, pH is fine, and uh, there are no diseases. But other than that, it's completely passive. So what do you need for this? Um, as Andrea has briefly mentioned, we need net pots. Uh, so this is important for the growing medium and the plant to grow. And it can generally be between two to three inches in diameter. Here's a container. I know there's a nice cat looking in the container, but a suitable container is needed for the nutrient solution to stay. And ideally an inert substance like glass is the best, but a uh, food grade plastic is commonly used. We also use the food grade plastic just because it's a little more flexible, easier to carry and um, easier to replace nutrient solution. Number three, you need a LED glow light, especially if you're going indoors. You can use the sun if you're outdoors, but um, if you're going indoors, the LED lights mimic the wavelengths of the sun, which cause photosynthesis. So you need it to be uh, as intense, uh, intensity-wise, equivalent of the sun indoors. 
And finally, you need hydroponic nutrients, of course. So we recommend using General Hydroponics MaxiGrow. We're not sponsored by it. Um, we're open to sponsors, but but um, this is because it's it's a very general nutrient solution applicable to most vegetables you can grow hydroponically. And uh, this is a ratio 10, 5, 14. So whenever you see ratios like this, it means it's the ratio of N nitrogen to P phosphorus to K potassium. So this is this is called NPK ratio in um, indoor growing. And um, plants need macronutrients. NPK are the main nutrients that, that they need in fertilizers. But along with that, they essentially need trace micronutrients such as magnesium, manganese, boron, chromium, zinc, tin, and so on. And this is because um, these trace nutrients are used for making the chlorophyll they need for photosynthesis. So all of these nutrients are contained in the right ratio in these uh, general hydroponics maxi grow, um, which is why we use it and, and it, it did give us good results. Okay, so growing media. There are many types of mediums you can use for growing in hydroponics. Uh, so let's start with rock wool. Uh, you might have seen this in aeroponic systems. It's an inert growth medium. It's composed of granite and limestone, and it's generally used for tracky, wick, and high aeroponic systems. Um, similar to rock wool, there's root bug, but it's not inert. It's made from organic material fortified with hydroponic nutrients, and its main main goal is to start roots. So uh, it's well suited for hydro aeroponics, even tracky and water culture. And the the main ease of use and the convenient part of rock wool and root plug is that if you decide to start plants from the seed, all you really have to do is plant the seed in the center hole here and uh, just water it until it becomes a seedling. And we personally use root plug for our system. Then you have cocoa coir, and that's organic coconut fiber. It holds moisture and it's good for aeration of herbs because there are air gaps between these fibers. So it's good for herbs and vegetable roots. Now we've seen this most commonly used for growing microgreens. We haven't had any experience with cocoa coir, but it's good for uh, flat systems uh, for smaller plants as well. And lastly, you have loose mediums, and this means uh, pebbles, rocks. So, so this is called hydroton. It, these are clay pebbles. Then you have similarly you have perlite and gravel. So they're not solid mediums which hold the uh, plant. I mean, they hold the plant, but they're they have to be in uh, aggregates. Uh, so we tried this initially. The problem with this is the seed, if you plant it, it can go easily between the gaps of hydrotons or loose pebbles. So we, we didn't use this, but uh, we have seen systems which use hydrotons, so you can give it a shot. So how do you create your Kratky system? Uh, again, there are many blogs and videos explaining how to make your Kratky bucket, but the three main steps uh, are just first of, all, first of all, you drill a hole in a five gallon bucket. So that's about 20 liter bucket and place a net cup in it. And um, then the net cup has the thing to hold the plant, which is the rock wool or root plug. So this has the seedling and within the net cup, you need something to hold that root plug. So we, we use styrofoam, you can use pebbles as well, just to hold the root plug. And then finally, you mix the nutrients in about four gallons or 15 liters of water and mix it according to the packet instructions. They, they will, the ratios will be there on whatever nutrient solution you buy. The other thing is you can make your own nutrients as well uh, using different salts, but we're not going to cover that in this class. That might be safe for another one. Okay, so here are the cost of parts required for a cracky bucket. And these are, unfortunately, these are in US dollars uh, because that's where we bought most of our things. Um, so you, you need a nutrient solution and uh, that's 10, 5, 14 NPK ratio. This is six, nearly $16, but it's not for one bucket. You can, you can uh, use this nutrient solution for up to 10 systems. So this is really the nutrient cost for 10 systems. Then you have a five gallon bucket um, you can get this for free, especially from uh, construction places or restaurants, or you can get buckets for, for free if you look for them. Um, then you have three inch net cups. Uh, again, most gardens and nurseries have net cups laying around so you can grab them, but they do cost just 33 cents per cup. And plant seeds, um, you can buy this or gather this from a community garden. And then finally you need a 
rock wool or root plug. Uh, this you have to, it's good, good to buy new because you don't want used uh, rock wool. It's, it's always good to start fresh when you're planting. Uh, and the total cost comes out to be about $31. But like I said, you can get a lot of this for free. And um, yeah, so, so that's all. And recommended plants to grow. So for hydroponics, we recommend starting with leafy greens. And this is because they're hard, hard, hardy plants. They're, they, you can't easily kill them. And uh, they're very easy to grow. They grow very fast as well. So starting off, we recommend kale, which we grew successfully, cabbage, spinach, lettuce, and basil. If, if you can master these five, then you can move forward with strawberries, cherry tomatoes, even bell pepper and other herbs. So these, we, we, from our experience, are easier to grow and recommended for beginners. Now let's go into our system, which is uh, the picture you see there, the container, the plant. You have a tent LED light, so I'm going to uh, explain all of this next. So we did everything based on this YouTube video by Family Plot. We're going to share these slides later, and there are clickable links, so please check it out. All the instructions we're going to share um, are based off this video. So these are just some pictures we're going to go through. We started from seed. We're going to show how to start from seed and go into the entire system. Again, you can see the container with the plants. There's this uh, tube here. I'm going to talk about that. You have the tiny plants there. And then the frame, which uh, we're going to uh, explain how to uh, build it. So parts needed for this, uh, you need seven half inch PVC tees, four half inch PVC elbows, one half inch PVC pipe, and you can buy uh, 10 feet, that's enough. So these three uh, parts needed at the top are to build your frame, which is gonna go inside the container. And then you also need one half inch uh, sleeve to thread adapter, one half inch 90 degree barb elbow, and one half inch uh, grommet. These three are gonna uh, compose your water draining system. And you can see everything is based off a uh, half inch uh, measurement. Then as Andrew mentioned, you need net cups. For this particular system, you can grow up to 12 plants. So we put there 12 feet in these net cups. You need 127 gallon container. Uh, this is an active system, it's aeroponic. So we do use one water pump. You also need for the irrigation, you need um, 12 half inch 180 degree sprinklers for um, half inch 360 degree sprinklers. And I'm gonna talk about the differences between the degrees here. And then as Anchor mentioned, the nutrient solution. You also need one half inch vinyl tubing and three feet uh, is enough um, for this. One pool noodle, um, this uh, it's, it's to hold the plants into the net cup. I'm gonna show this later. And then because we are growing indoors in the apartment, we did buy a 300 watt LED grow light. And then optionally, you can also have a tent and I'm gonna um, explain why we chose to use the tent. So for equipment, you need a hand driller. PVC pipe cutter makes it much easier to cut the PVC, but you know, if you have other tools, you can use that as well. The three inch hole dozer is to you know, uh, make a hole on the lead to put the net cups. And then 11 by 64 drill bit. This is to drill the holes on the PVC frame to um, install the uh, sprayers. So these are some pictures. You can see uh, the frame here on the left. You can see that the PVC elbows are at the four corners here. So I need four of them. And then the PVC tees, you have seven in total. So there's one, two, three, four. There's one here in the middle, which is gonna to connect to the pump. So that's five, six, seven. And you can see the sprinkler distribution here, which I'm gonna talk um, in a second. Here you have a picture of the pump here. This is the sleep to thread adapter that I mentioned. And there's this uh, vertical PVC part here, which is gonna connect uh, to the middle of the frame. And then this is just a zoomed in um, portion of this middle part here and rotate it a little bit. But um, you need very small PVC parts here to connect these three teams uh, together. Mm -hmm. So here's uh, the container. You take the lead off, you just place uh, your pump there with your uh, speaker adapter and your PV vertical PVC part there. 
And um, it is recommended when you add the nutrient solution, the nutrient solution is recommended to have 1.5 teaspoons of nutrients to one gallon of water. And you usually add 10 to 12 gallons of nutrient solutions if you're using 12 plants. And then you can water your plants um, twice a day if they're siblings. And then three times a day is once they reach that vegetative um, stage or growth stage. And you can see here um, at the bottom here, and also in this picture, you're gonna need to drill a hole here to have your uh, water drain system. That's to drain the nutrient solution out and then replace that later on. So we did use, this is the grommet here. This is uh, the barb elbow. And this is uh, the vinyl tubing. We could not find the right size for the vinyl tubing, the half inch. So we had to buy uh, a sizer above. And that's why we needed this kind of tightening uh, tool here to, to make it work. But if you find the right size, you'll be fine. More pictures, as you can see, after you um, drew the hole for the nut cups, these cups are, once you close the lid, they're gonna be you know, below the frame. And then um, with the sprayers, the sprayers are gonna spray directly into the roots of the plants. You can see how uh, the vertical PVC part here connects to the, to the frame. And then um, once the roots start touching the water, then you can turn off your pump and um, you can start using this as a crab kit system as Uncle said, as a passive system. You need to turn on and off your pump every time. And then this is the complete system. Um, this is inside my bedroom, and I'm going to talk later on about the LED light um, and the tent, but you can see uh, this system here. So if you're going to start from seeds uh, like we did, you're going to grab your root plugs, um, and then you water it once or twice a day outside of the system, so not with nutrient solution. And then when uh, they reach this size here in the middle picture, that's when you can transpose them into the system and you grab uh, the net cup and then your root plug, you're going to put it as it is. But the, you know, to hold this root plug in here, that's why we use the uh, pool noodle. So you can cut those into smaller rings of uh, one to two inches width. Cut that on the side so it has this opening here and that's going to hold your uh, root plug into the uh, net cup. Uh, I think most places recommend that you use neoprene, but um, instead of pool noodle, but I think it's more expensive if you have pool noodle and you don't go to the pool very often, you know, you can just use that. These are the dimensions that you, you need. For the outer length, you use 26 uh, 3 quarters inches. For the inner, inner length, uh, 25. And then for the width, you use 16 and a half inches. For sprinklers, um, we use two types. So as a, again, we got this from the family thought video. They use 180 and 330 degrees sprays. We do not use 330, we use 360. That's simply because uh, it's really hard to find 330 uh, sprayers in the market. So you bought 180 and 360, and you can see that the 12 180 degrees uh, sprayers go on the outer part of the um, frame, and then the four, 360 sprayers go in the inner part. So that way the plants are getting uh, water, the nutrient solution um, from all directions. Mm -hmm. So this is uh, the big part, um, cost of parts. And this is a clickable link. So we made this, I'm gonna open real quick. We made this available uh, for you guys. We're gonna send this presentation later on. But we did, you know, added everything, quantity, item, uh, price. And then we also, you know, have listed here some um, stores where you can buy. These might be a little bit outdated because we did this last year, but not by much. And um, we are sorry that everything is in dollars and, you know, a uh, gallon and inches. <laughs> but I did put a little bit here in liters and milliliters and, you know, the metric system. But um, overall, if we, you include the tent and the LED grow light, the cost is gonna end up being $345. We know that's a lot. Um, we are two people, we split this cost, so we know it's easier on us, but um, just want everyone to keep in mind that this is a one-time cost. After you have the system set up, you can grow you know, plants for you know, as long as you want, and eventually this is gonna pay off. But um, if you don't wanna go grow, grow your, if you don't wanna have a tent, 
the price without the tent drops a little bit. And if you have outdoors or if you have an alternative for the grow light, then it goes uh, below $100. And I want to add that this is a four square feet system. So it's two feet by two feet nearly, um, which is yeah, what we did. <laughs> so the main reason we use the tent. So we, as I mentioned, this is in my bedroom. So when we had the system there with the LED light, um, the entire room would be pink or red. And that was really annoying for my eyes. Every time, you know, I go in there, it really hurts a little bit, it can be annoying. So we decided to purchase a tent and it ended up being, uh, you know, boosting the growth of the plants because this tent is specifically for hydroponics and the walls of it are reflective. So, you know, the plants end up having, absorbing more energy from, from the grow light. But you can also improvise and have the tent, you know, in a different uh, type. You don't need to buy specifically hydroponics one. Regarding the LED light uh, time use, so we bought this one from Hydro Crunch. It contains two lights, one vegetated and one uh, bloom. We use the bloom light uh, for the initial, initial sealing stage. So we leave it on for around 14 hours a day for four to six weeks. And then once the plants you know, grow a little bit more, then we use the vegetated uh, light for um, eight to 10 hours a day. And it is important that you set your LED uh, grow light two to three feet away from the plants. I also left it here for you guys to access the original parts list by family plot. You can see that there are going to be some differences. Like one example is the neoprene. Instead of that, we use the pool noodles, the 330 degrees splinter as well. They do not mention any root plugs. Uh, they grow plants that are already in a vegetative uh, state, so they just transpose that with the um, neoprene. And then they also have a pump bag. We did not purchase the pump bag, but you know it is recommended because you can avoid clogs uh, into the into the pump. Mm -hmm. Another thing they provide, you know, if the grow light might be too expensive, too much for your budget, they also provide an alternative to build your own simple grow light. And they also have I just linked here their you know general page on hydroponics. All right, so as with any system, there are potentials for diseases and pests. So we want to start off with white flies here. Uh, oops, sorry. <laughs> so white flies are very tiny. They can seem like white specks on the leaf, but uh, they can be annoying. They're not necessarily harmful, but they eat the underside of leaves, lay eggs, and leave a yellow residue. So actually, our kale were packed in very high densities in the system initially. And we had a problem of white flies. And uh, whenever we harvested it, some of the kale had like scratch marks or yellow residue. So we couldn't necessarily eat it raw. We had to really wash it. Or if it was too bad, we had to actually compost it. So the way we solved this problem is, first of all, uh, we were trying to get neem oil. Neem oil is a suggested remedy. It's organic. Uh, however, a lot of neem oil sold here in the US is mixed with pesticides whose ingredients are not even named. So we decided to go with sticky traps, uh, which, which have glue on them. And we hung them up above near the LED light on, in the system. And um, they trap quite a percentage of, of the white flies. Then you can have spider mites and aphids. And these are similar insects. Uh, but unlike white flies, white flies arise more when there's a high population density of leaves. Spider mites and aphids arise when the leaves themselves lack certain nutrients, uh, specifically magnesium. So it is important to keep the nutrient level good and monitor the health of your leaves. And if they are dead or if they are uh, somewhat diseased, it's good to remove them before uh, insect infestation or other diseases can arise. Then you can have mold. Uh, this is a picture of our system, actually. We had mold on, some mold on our system. And the reason is um, there was nutrient leakage, nutrient solution leakage when the spray was on. So it came outside the system and it stayed in light and um, some mold was formed around, the, around each net pot. So we cleaned it with paper and towels and um, helped disinfect it. But the way to prevent it is to prevent water from leaking outside the system. Next, you have root rot. And this is a common problem. This can arise when uh, roots are submerged completely in water for prolonged periods of time, which uh, cuts it off from oxygen flow. So um, 
root rot is uh, easily identifiable because what, two things will happen. The roots will start smelling really bad because of microorganism infestation. And secondly, the roots look like a bundled, mushy, wet mass. It's, it's not like normal roots, like hanging and loose, you know, similar to hair. But um, it's, it's kind of disgusting to look at. So that's how you know you have root rot. And the solution is to just allow oxygen flow. And finally, you can have mildew, which is again a fungal disease on the leaves. Uh, this can happen when the humidity is above 50%, it's, it's really high, and the airflow has to be stagnant for this to happen. So again, allowing airflow, allowing um, oxygen flow, keeping the nutrients uh, level accurate and, and good for the leaves, and avoiding high population density will solve most of these problems. So since we're going to email you this presentation, we wanted to include the descriptions, but this is just what I mentioned. Um, however, it's just for your reference. Then we have maintenance, and this is a very critical part of having a hydroponic system. As Uncle said, you need to remove all in case you get them. So clean the system regularly with a paper or towel to avoid, avoid mold issues. Prune the leaves like a conventional farming setup. Uh, remove dead and dry leaves and stems, so keep your plants uh, neat and tidy. Also, as mentioned, check roots regularly, so to prevent root rot, open the leaves, check the roots every two weeks or so, they should not be mushy. Replace nutrients. Uh, every month, we do replace our nutrient solution through the, you know, we just drain the water through that uh, tubing, and then replace with a new nutrient solution because, you know, the plants are, you know, feeding themselves um, from those um, nutrient solutions. Check pH, as I'm mentioned at the beginning, make sure you check, check the pH uh, to see if it's between 5.5 and 6.5. Especially, uh, this is especially critical for sensitive plants. We personally do not do this, uh, do not have, haven't first yet a pH meter, but this is definitely important. Um, and then lastly, check on the size of leaves. As he mentioned, we had white flies in our kale and they were mostly on the underside of the leaves. So make sure you check those um, every once in a while. And then automation. Um, we did automate our system. You know, if you don't want to worry about you know not being at home to water your plants, you can uh, buy timers for your LED light and your pump. So we did end up buying an analog timer for the LED light and one digital timer for the pump. And then you know, using your pump with the digital timer, you just need to set it you know two times a day for 15 seconds for seedlings or uh, three times a day for 30 seconds uh, for the vegetative, vegetative stage. And this depends on your plants, depend how many plants you have. So you wanna monitor and adjust the timers if you're gonna automate your system. And also those are links, you can check those at Amazon. There's some pictures that we wanted to share. We don't really like our results. So the first one here at the top, uh, these are, um, the roots of our plants, you can see that they are very white and, and loose. So that means that they are very healthy. This is a bowl of kale that we enjoy eating uh, later. This is how big you know, the plants got and you know, just emphasizing the importance of pruning your plants. And here you have the cabbage that we cooked here in this um, bottom center picture. We do want to share lessons learned um, and future steps. Obviously, it wasn't perfect. We you know, made mistakes, so we think it's important to share that as well. So regarding LED light and tent, because we are growing indoors, we totally uh, think this was worth it. The light uh, boosted the plant's growth and it ended up not being energy intensive. My electricity bill did not go up uh, that much, just a little bit, not compared to the heater uh, <laughs> in the winter is much more. And then the tent um, is just much better for the eyes, especially if you now with you know the pandemic, you spend a lot of time indoors. Um, the tent really helped me with that. Yeah, and uh, things can go wrong, so it's important to be patient and try again. We actually lost our tomato plants um, eventually when we were trying to change the setup. They were nearing the vegetative state, so they were nearing the, the to getting to a fruit state. But um, we'll we'll show you the picture in a moment uh, where we basically kill them accidentally. <laughs> and it's important to use the right equipment. Uh, the right drill bit cutting tools can make a huge difference in making the assembly more efficient. So a uh, short story on that is that we needed an 11 by 64 drill bit, as Andrea mentioned, for the sprays of our system. 
but initially we just had a five by 32, which is 10 by 64. So close enough, but not really. So we, we drilled quite a few holes with that, but we had to, um, you can imagine we had to do it on the side, enlarge it, enlarge it. And that took way more time and effort instead of if just, if we just bought like a $7 drill bit, it would have made a big difference. So we learned the hard way not to compromise on the right tools because it can be an investment for future projects as well. And then- um, Yeah, lastly, population density. Uh, you know, we did talk about white flies and you know, maintenance. We did grow 12 plants at the beginning, but we thought that was really hard to maintain, so hard to access, hard to prune. So this time we're doing only six plants. So it is up to you. Um, this is just our experience. Oh, so and, yeah. let's uh, show some pictures. Yeah, uh, additional pictures to show. Yeah. So uh, these are actually our dead tomatoes. They wilted uh, because we changed the nutrient solution, first of all. But then the roots were directly immersed in a lot of water uh, from nothing. And uh, you know that causes root rot by now. So. <laughs> So that's what happened and we didn't know what to do at the time. But um, one other thing is that they were, reach they were really uh, tall. They were closing the height to the LED light. And um, if you grow such plants indoors in a tent, it has physical limitations. So we learned not to grow super tall plants and high maintenance plants like tomatoes right away. Um, it's important to just keep, it, keep the vegetation lower and grow the easier leafy greens plants, cabbage, kale, lettuce, et cetera. Um, at and, least in the beginning. And you can see this is something we didn't mention during the presentation, but we did have, we ended up purchasing these uh, metal thin poles here to just get the tomatoes up straight. Yeah. And this is after we, you know, we took, a, after we noticed how much, you know, how dense the population is, this is after we harvested all of our kale and cleaned mm -hmm. that up. So that's why you only have like three plants here. Mm -hmm. These are just more pictures. You can see how you know which kale we have there. <laughs> we a lot more pictures of our system, just so you can see the height. And this is what we have now, actually. This is a picture of last week. We started from scratch because, as I mentioned, we <laughs> accidentally killed our plants. And now we're ju doing just six, seven plants. And um, for the holes that don't have any net cuts, we place these paper sheets here just to avoid the the light going to the water because mm -hmm. it's mimicking the sun. It can cause you know algae growth or eutrophization. So we make sure to not let the water um, in direct contact with the the light. Yeah. Here are pictures of roots. You can see again white and um, roots. Mm -hmm. More pictures of roots. This is the KO, How tall um, we got one of them. <laughs> And I think that's it. Yeah, that's it. So, okay. all right. So, yeah, I want to thank you so much for attending the class. Really hope you guys learn and like, take this outside of the class to try yourselves. Again, we are SPOR, Supporting Public Outreach Resources and Education, which is part of a mycelium NGO. So, please do check us out at sporehse.org. We left our emails there for contact. And we are all uh, all over social media, so please uh, do follow us there. So with that, we want to thank our Patreon donors. Uh, we are very grateful to have Patreons Alex Blasius, Benjamin Blasius, Benjamin Gray, and Jeanette Blasius. So Blasius family, thank you so much. <laughs> and here, lastly, we left all of our um, contact information. We have the Mycelium website, all the contact emails. We are on Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram. We also have a sport YouTube channel, which we, we post classes like this. So please check it out and subscribe. And, you know, we do this for free and it takes a lot of time of effort. So please consider donating to us or becoming a patron as well. Yeah, so with that, um, we thank you so much for joining the class. Now we're open to questions. Uh, I see we have a lot of comments in the chat. So we're gonna now answer your questions and uh, let's, let's stop the screen share. All right, so let's see, chat. So I wrote down some of the questions, but I believe Dan's answered most of them. Um, they asked, uh, Elena asked, well, what do you do with the mediums once they're spent? Ah, 
Great question. So uh, it, it honestly depends. Uh, once they're completely spent, like with the roots, we compost them because you cannot reuse the mediums with uh, roots. But if what, what's happened is um, if you grow a certain seedling and it, it fails, which has happened in the past, then you can replant it with another seed because the roots have not yet fully come out. So we have reused uh, root plugs um, if the seedling has failed, but once the full plant has formed, we, we compost or throw it in the backyard or something. Okay. Uh, I've got a second question was from Mariana. She said, mm -hmm. um, can you put more than one net cup per bucket? Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, we've seen systems with up to three, uh, three net cups per bucket in the cracky system. But again, the number of net cups depends on the types of plants you're growing. So if you're growing, let's say, a heavy nutrient sucker like tomato, uh, only one is recommended. But if you're growing lettuce or kale, you can grow up to three on one bucket. So, so the number of net cups depends on uh, the amount of nutrient solution and the types of plants you're growing. All right, number three uh, from Chris and Rachel, mm -hmm. how to prevent mold. Uh, it was explained in the video, but uh, if you want right. to elaborate in any way. Sure. You, you want to go? Uh, yeah, it's just, um, as Uncle said, just uh, preventing the, you know, water, the nutrient solution to going outside on top of the lid. But you can, you know, always clean it up uh, with um, a paper towel or, you know, just a towel. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, I see Jeff has a great question. He's been growing in mason jars, again, a great method, mason jars on his windowsill. Do we need to be worried about sunlight hitting the roots and nutrient solutions directly? Uh, the answer to this is yes, uh, especially if it's transparent, but uh, an easy way around this is covering the mason jars uh, with the roots and nutrients, uh, covering that with an aluminum foil or growing it in a black or some, some kind of reflective uh, uh, mason jar. So just making, just covering it with aluminum foil, uh, at least the bottom part will, will help a lot. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I've got another yeah. one here from uh, Elena. Uh, is the temp, is the tent temperature controlled as well? Um, with we that one. Did, yeah, we did talk. We haven't like measured temperature. We did think about it, but we as of about now, it. yeah, we don't have control of that, but you know, it's in the it's apartment. It's room temperature. Yeah, it's room temperature. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. if you have a tent somewhere else, it might be good to have uh, a temperature control. But the thing is, uh, again, we use a tent because we didn't have other space, but if you have a closet, my friend has done, like, taken care of our system in his closet. So um, if you have a closet or some kind of other room where you don't use it, just, just use that instead. It'll save you a lot, lot of money. Yeah. <laughs> uh, next one, another from Elena. Do you have any experience using insecticidal soaps or is that too risky for a hydroponic system? No, we don't have experience and uh, we, we wouldn't want to because insecticidal soaps, while they can help with insect problems, um, it, it all gets mixed eventually in the nutrient solution and then it gets sucked by the roots. So we, we were firmly against using pesticides and insecticides, uh, but some people might have used them. Uh, I, we don't know enough yeah. about it. Yeah. Okay. Um, next one is from Marty. Were white huh? flies an indoor problem? Yes. Or is it ex exclusive? <laughs> Surprisingly, yes. It, it's not mm -hmm. only indoor, but it can be. Um, there are there are other um, other like cabbages grown outdoors and spinach grown outdoors also have white flies, um, but it can be indoors and outdoors. So, yeah, it can happen anywhere. Yeah, definitely. Quite like when I first saw them, I think mean, I was the first one to see. I was mm -hmm. like, how the heck did they? Yeah, go, get even yeah, get here, here inside the tent. Um, yeah. But yeah. it's, it's insane. It's really impressive. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, got one from James Clure. Can you mm -hmm. use peat moss to grow in? Yeah, actually I've seen, I've just read about it briefly. Um, I don't know enough, but, but you can. It's possible to use peat moss as a growth medium. Um, and in especially outdoor settings, it, it might be more common, but indoor, 
peat moss has a lot of other organic minerals and nutrients which can interfere with the nutrient solution. So not sure about how that affects growth of plants, but uh, but yeah, it's possible. Okay. Uh, I've got another one. I've got one from XV. Uh, mm -hmm. Can the can the production of or the can the produce of a worm compost be used as a nutrient? That's mm -hmm. an awesome question, mm -hmm. and uh, my answer to initial answer to that is worm compost can be used as a strong nutrient in outdoor gardens. It's the best, but for hydroponic nutrients, you need nutrients that can dissolve in the water. So worm compost will sink because it's species of worms and. Um, my my initial answer is it's not a good nutrient for hydroponic systems because it's not dissolvable. Um, but for outdoor compost settings or gardens, um, it's it's as you know, it's wonderful. And if I may just add a little yeah. bit, I'm not sure if people can hear me, but uh, one answer I also gave on that note is compost tea, which is something you guys didn't necessarily discuss, um, but it is. The act of literally turning compost into a liquid nutrient that you spray onto your plants, uh, you make it basically like you would expect making regular tea. Um, you make a, you get this kind of mesh bag, and you put a bunch of compost ingredients, including worm castings, in there, and then you kind of put them in a, a bucket with an air stone to make sure it gets plenty of oxygen. Otherwise, it gets it goes bad, um, and then you run it for about 24 hours, just kind of steeping in that water making sure it gets the oxygen and the results are just a very nutrient dense liquid you can use that's also organic. Again, if you're using something like aeroponics, it might contain too many large chunks that'll clog up the nozzles. Um, but for outdoor use in general garden, and maybe even for something like the crack tea method, it might work great. Awesome. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, Dan. Um, got one from Magda. Uh, how often do you change your growing solution? Every month. Yeah, every month we make sure we, you know, drain everything and then add again 10 to 12 gallons of nutrient solution back into the container. Okay. Well, we've got one from Dawn. Uh, they say they have a, a three hydro stacker units. Uh, do you have any suggestions for the type of medium? Uh, and is uh, is this a passive type of system? Mm -hmm. Hydro stacker. Hydro stacker. Uh, well, yeah. They have a link in the chat. So. Yeah, let's open the link. Um, okay, so it's a vertical hydroponic growing system. Okay, so it's stacked. Ah, stacked. Oh, okay, okay, nice. interesting. Awesome. This is great. Um, hmm. We're not. Yeah, I, yeah. I'll be honest, I'm, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know either. Um, I, I would assume clay pebbles would be good for such systems because it seems like they're not growing completely from seed. They're little plants installed. Um, but again, I personally don't have any experience with this. Yeah. Yeah, that's also what I suggested. Yeah. yeah. Um, and they yeah, also play, play mm -hmm. they also asked do you do you know if if they need to water the pots individually? Uh, I'm guessing it falls down, and I guess if yeah. it makes sure it gets yeah enough. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, it, yeah. It seems like if you water from the top, it can seep into the other uh, downward stack. So that that might help. Um, we've got one from Janavi. Uh, Spider mites have tended to be persistent in my house. Uh, mm -hmm. Tried neem oil, but it nearly killed the plants. Uh, do you suggest, oh, no. you suggested an alternative spray. Can you please repeat that part? Do you wanna take this? Um, sure, I'm, we, I think use not a, a alternative spray. We did use um, for white flies, not for spider mites, but we did use sticky traps. Uh, yeah, we didn't put a picture, but um, yeah, these are just you know sticky traps that you open them and then they have glue on both sides, and we just hang them like right below our LED grow light, and then that worked a lot. I don't know about spider mites. Yeah. Um, yeah Dan suggested yeah. Doctor Earth. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah. I'm not familiar yeah. with that. Yeah. Um, so that's a, it. It uses a mix of neem oil and other things. There are also some. Um, 
solutions that they've put together that don't have neem oil, but they are all natural. They use things like rosemary, rosemary oil, cinnamon oil, uh, chilies, and like different things. The thing to keep in mind is that although uh, spider mites are present on the leaves, one thing you can do actually that works is vacuum them off. I know that sounds weird, but literally just take a vacuum, gently vacuum, make sure it's not like a shop vac, but gently vacuum them, vacuum all their, uh, all of them off the leaves as much as possible. But then also keep in mind that during winter time when it gets cold, they actually go into the soil and hibernate and lay a bunch of eggs. And so if you have like a dead plant and it's sitting there or old soil of in infected spider mites, they're probably still going to have eggs in the soil. So if, especially during the winter, if there's no plants in there, take the pot out there and let it freeze solid and just freeze it. And it should, as long as it gets really cold inside, those, those eggs should die. I'm not sure. Maybe they could come back to life. I don't know. But point is, is uh, they hide in the soil and you can also vacuum them off. And then combined with some spraying and just making sure you tend to it often, it should be able to deal with it. Definitely, if you have one plant and not and it's not on other plants, remove that infected plant as soon as possible. Yeah, we've had a couple of other suggestions in the chat. We had this pure green, uh, pure spray green. Um, also, uh, Valerie su also suggests 100% uh, mineral oil. Um, they said it's a Canadian product. It may not be available here, but. Um, they said this worked for them. Pure spray green. Okay. Yeah. Um, I've got another another question uh, from Marty. Uh, where do you buy your seeds? Do you recommend retailers like Walmart or Home Depot, or is there a better source? We, we got well, from Home Depot. Yeah, some yeah. of them. We also had a seed swap here in Huntsville, right. but we got from um, Walmart or Home, Home, Home Depot. We got yeah, from yeah. Home Depot. Yeah. yeah. We, we did get from Home Depot, but if you can get seeds uh, from nurseries uh, or community gardens, uh, they, that, that might work. And we, we try to get organic seeds, like heirloom seeds, uh, which can make their own seeds. So. Yeah, I believe in our, our microgreens class, we talked a little bit about that using mm -hmm. um, local farms. I think they used, uh, what's that farm that's doing the Huntsville compost? Yeah. I think they had ones. some, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, uh, I think uh, that's all the questions that I've seen in the chat so far. Um, Great. If anyone but yeah, if anyone any wants to talk or you can feel free to unmute yourself if you want to comment or ask anything. Uh, we are here for a few more minutes, so. Yeah, this was free. great. I'm this, is, this is awesome. Thankful for all the feedback we've gotten. These are some great questions. And. Um, oh, OK, so. Elena, you wanna? Elena, yeah. Elena says she has experience using watered down dish soap. So spraying the infected leaves and rinsing the plant under the sink uh, to make sure you don't get soapy water on the leaves. So that's that's something good. Yeah. Um, it definitely works on aphids too because they have this kind of coating on their skin or shell or something that reacts to the, the soapy water. Um, yeah, and, and then for insects that have big shells, there's also uh, diatomaceous earth or uh, DE. It's a bunch of little like spikes basically that they just it's like walking on glass for them. So it's just it's a deterrent for ants and things. Yep. And yep. Jeff suggests uh, uh, he's been drowning his roots uh, and letting the sunlight in the mason jars. Uh, uh, adding a, you say you've been adding a cap full of hydrogen peroxide after washing the roots, and that's been helping. So, that's absolutely. Another suggestion. So, yeah. uh, Don asks if we'll be putting the link. So, so we'll actually email you since you have uh, given us the emails via Eventbrite. We, we have you on our Spore email list, and we have recorded the presentation, and we'll be sending the PDF as well. That's right. um, yeah. One thing is, if you can follow us on our social media, we'll be sending those links as well. Um, that will be very much appreciated. And a review uh, of Spore on, on the Facebook page would be great. Too. Yeah, and I'd like to plug, we have another, we, we do a class every month. Uh, so the next one we do, every other month we'll do a 3D printing intro. It's kind of the same class, but we try to pick a topic to like center in on to kind of make it kind of fresh. And then every other month we do a circular economy type uh, class like this one 
Uh, we did microgreens, we did food systems. Um, and so we've got a lot of, of different variety in different classes. So next month we'll be doing 3D printing uh, with a focus on 3D printed food, which is a really big new topic, which also kind of fits into circular economy as, uh, as people are trying to grow foods at home. Now you can take that and basically have your own Star Trek replicator in your house. Uh, I'm really excited to talk about that kind of stuff. So um, uh, if, you, if you follow us, you'll get an invite to that class as well. Sounds awesome. Yeah, uh, again, our, our trademark is Spore HSV and Spore Huntsville Online. So uh, feel free to look out and uh, we'll be, again, sending you everything on emails mm -hmm. pretty soon. So be sure on the lookout for us. I've got one last second question. Yeah. Uh, Marty asks, do the seeds rest on top of the grow medium or do they press into the medium a little bit? Uh, you, yeah, press into the medium mm -hmm. a little bit. With the root plug, yeah. you just make sure, yeah, you press it, it down. Goes in. Yeah. yeah, so uh, you want the roots to go through the root plug and uh, the seedling to come out. So generally uh, an inch or inch and a half below the surface is, is a good, good metric. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, awesome. We also have some last second <laughs> things. Are we all? Yeah. Any any questions? We're we'll very happy to answer. Yeah, and um, you're welcome to email us as well. Just just because yeah. the class is over doesn't mean we're we're not willing to help. So <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you can always yep. reach out to us. Always reach out, and we're very happy to interact. So. Mm -hmm. So, thank you for joining. Yeah, yeah thank you so with much. that, thank you everyone so much. This was an amazing class. Right. All right. All right. Bye, Hopefully, everyone. we'll see you soon. Yeah. Bye. 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 Bye.